Hey, Russell. Hi. Good afternoon. Good How afternoon. Are you? Very good. Nice to meet you in person. And you, and you. I heard so much about you, and uh, I was uh, very excited reading your your story, starting uh, in in the Elverton Manor when you were a kid. I would say, right? Something. Well, well, you were. I was, I was 20, 27 when I started. Oh, well, so. still a young a young boy, and uh, and then uh, to get to to the only. Uh, Michelin star chef, uh, Michelin star restaurant in uh, in Dorchester, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about a little bit about your career. A very a pretty brilliant career. But the, the most curious thing I want to know after, before I want you to tell me something about your career, but why you left the restoration, the restaurant? Uh, <laughs> I, I I I can imagine why, but I want you to to say it. So say something about. Uh, tell us something about your career. Uh, the emotion when you got the first the first star the, the first time you were the head chef of a restaurant tell me some some details about that yeah sure um it was a career change for me um i was as i said i was 27 when i started cooking in a in a professional kitchen um with a head chef who was just six months older than i was um and it was a complete culture change, um, a completely new experience, but I came to it with a, a real passion for food. Um, my parents had a small holding and a farm shop when I was growing up, so food had always been really important. Um, but yes, go, going into a professional kitchen for the first time was a was an eye opener, and uh, I loved it. And I was it was very lucky that the uh, the guy who I was working for was a great craftsman um, and I, I learned all the key bits of discipline and sauce making and butchery and fish prep and things like that. And uh, it went on from there. Um, and you, t you spoke, you said something about discipline. Discipline is something that I've seen every time I get into a very important kitchen. Yeah. I see an atmosphere that is very kind of uh, like military uh, regime, kind of. And, and especially for a young boy, being in such an atmosphere must be uh, very, uh, there, there must be a lot of pressure in it. And I, I'm sure that sometimes you think, what the hell am I doing here? I don't want to do this job anymore. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, it's notoriously the hours are reasonably long and you know it is a it is a pressured environment um, but I think the industry's changed a lot over the last you know 25 years and it's it's become um, a softer industry in that there's there's you know um, better hours now than they used to be and a, a lot of the bad practices that were in kitchens of you know, hopefully been eradicated. And, you know, I, I like to think the kitchens I ran were places where people wanted to come to work um, and they enjoyed, enjoyed being there. Okay, let's go to the, to the famous Michelin star. <laughs> when, when it arrives, that, that was another emotion, I, I bet. And, uh, uh, and also probably made you change a lot of your of your habits in the kitchen with the customers in the in the dining room. I don't think it did make us change much, actually. Um, and it was it was an interesting thing that the first inspection we had from Michelin after we got the star. Um, one of the things that they said to me was, "Don't forget that you got the star for what you did last year, not what you're going to do this year." So you don't need to change things uh, and that that was a, a an interesting point to make uh, yeah that's true but to go for instance you 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 quit your your activity as as a restaurant owner and chef uh to do something probably for you more more interesting but usually uh that's right what you said but then uh, when you get the first star, you start thinking about the second one. What it, what it, what it takes to, to go from the first one to the second one and to the third? 
Yeah, you know, that's that's uh, chefs are naturally ambitious people, and um, you know, you want to move your business forward. Um, but for me, it was I never set out to get a star. Um, you know, we set out to serve great food, good seasonality. Um, you know, we had goals for the food, but but getting the star was something that I did never never imagined would happen. Um, so I, I, I suppose it was perhaps slightly different. Um, In your kitchen, how much yeah. there is innovation? Uh, research and how much is tradition or is a mix of all of them I think it's a mix of all of them you know we we drew uh, you know and I always have done I, I drew a lot of the food that I cooked from from the Mediterranean from Italy in particular um, you know pastas and risottos and gnocchi and, and things like that were, were key elements on our menu and you know things that we were proud of of doing well um, but it was most of my cooking certainly latterly and on beyond the restaurant has been driven by seasonality by the quality of the produce um, you know those those sorts of things and what made you uh, made you decide to quit the restaurant job even with a Michelin star with a with a great public yeah. great customers to do something different, always in the in the in the food industry, because I know you are a photographer, food photographer. You write for magazines. You you do a lot of work on uh, in in the in the business of of the food industry. But uh, what made you decide to change? Well, we we'd come to the end of our lease at the restaurant, um, and we we had a choice. We either carried on, and the restaurant was very small. We only had. 15, 15 seats. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I think anybody in the industry will know that you can't really make money out of a restaurant that size. Uh, so it was a, a crossroads, really. We either had to commit to renewing the lease and doing another 10 years. Um, you know, and I was coming up to 50 at the time. And you, you, you look at it and you think, you know, do I still want to be doing... 80, 90 hours a week in the restaurant when I'm nearly 60. So, um, so basically yeah. it was, was, was just a kind of choice uh, based on the, I want to live a more relaxed life and do what I really like uh, still in the business. Yeah, you know, I've got a huge passion for the catering industry. It's, a, it's an amazing business to be involved in. Um, I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, but it is a young person's game, and I think perhaps because I came to it, you know, a little bit later than most as well, you know, you're you're a little bit further down the line when the success starts to come. And um, you know, as I say, it was a bit of a crossroads. We had to we had to make a choice, and uh, you know, I, I miss the restaurant at times. There's there's nothing quite like the buzz of a of a good Saturday night service. Um, but there's nothing like the low of a bad one, right? Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> now, meanwhile, I want to say uh, hello and thanks for joining us, all the friends that they are uh, keeping joining us. Uh, and in between them, Angelo Mazarin, that is going to be our next uh, guest this morning in about uh, 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes. Angelo is going to be with us. He's an executive chef at La Sarumeria 104 in Miami. So Italian uh, restaurant, I would say Italian trattoria, but uh, with a very classy style um, food. Um, let's keep talking with, with uh, Russell. Uh, Russell, what gave you this period of quarantine? Did you, add the, did you take advantage of this period to, to create something? What, what gave you this quarantine moment? Well, I think, think yes. It's a, a hugely difficult time for us all, I think. Yeah, lots of uncertainty about what's coming in the future and especially for the, for the hospitality and the travel industry, how, how we're going to get back to some semblance of normality. Um, but I think you've got to try and stay positive and I'm still trying to produce content. Um, and I've, I've started learning or trying to teach myself how to edit and film video. 
as a, as well as stills and you know just trying to look at what might be useful in the future. Elena, your wife was beside you all the time of the restaurant and is still beside you in this new adventure? Well, she she has a real job, so uh, <laughs> she keeps the, yeah, I she think keeps you're... the money coming in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so she's the one that works and you are the one that play games. <laughs> like yes. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. I know. I know how precious is your job. Um, so let's talk about a little bit the market in England. The market in England is a little bit different than the market that we have in Italy or in the States. Um, how do you see the situation in England, especially now after after this uh, pandemic? Yeah, you know, I, I think the Given when I came into the catering industry, I think I've worked through a period of massive change in the UK. Um, you know, we weren't quite the laughing stock of cooks in Europe, but our, our cuisine wasn't held with any great regard when I started cooking. Whereas I think that's that's transformed completely. Um, you know, we are very highly regarded for what we do now. Um, you know, London is is up there with, with uh, New York and Milan and, and yeah, you know, all, yeah. all the major cities in the world, um, and that's that's rippled out to the rest of the country as well. Um, you know, there's some fantastic rural pubs doing amazing food. Um, you know, I think that you genuinely can get some great cooking across the whole of the UK now, um, and of course we have stunning produce to back it up with you know brilliant farmers and growers and yeah producers. absolutely but you know that's i know that's hugely important in your region um you know we we visited modena um the year we shut the restaurant um uh, so uh, i really hope i really hope next time you come you 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 will be able to stop at our farmhouse uh to check out our production and that stay and stay with us with your wife maybe a few days you know we are very close it's not just the balsamic i mean we are very close to no. to so many interesting things between the motors talking about ferrari maserati yeah. pagani cars and whatever but we also have amazing production of Parmes parmigiano reggiano prosciutto and so many other things but let's talk about what i really care more uh, as a producer let's talk about traditional balsamic vinegar. Um, as a chef, I'm sure you know what is the difference between the product that you usually find in the supermarket and the, the traditional production. Um, Very much. Uh, yeah. I would like to know what do you think about uh, balsamic, especially considering that balsamic nowadays is not anymore an Italian thing, is, is a worldwide yeah. thing. Yeah. So yeah. what do you know about balsamic? How do you use it if you use it? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you got, you got some of ours. I would like to, to hear from you live. We didn't talk before. I want to know what no, you no, think. <laughs> I want to know what do you think about our product. Uh, let, let me know something about your feelings about balsamic, about uh, the use of the traditional balsamic in the kitchen and, and so on. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic product. And um, we, we were lucky that when we were in Modena, we, um, we, we visited a... Um, Opera 02 um, and saw the traditional balsamic vinegar lofts and the Solera system and um, you know and it's there's so much tradition steeped in it and I, I th think one of the interesting things especially tasting through your products having that range of ages you know from from the three years up to the 40 years old um, the, the, the nuances and the subtleties as the flavors change and, and the vinegar becomes um, something very different as it, as it ages. The viscosity is beautiful and um, it's got a, a syrupy mouth feel to it, which is, which is wonderful. I want to say a couple of things about viscosity that you just, uh, you just uh, named. We have to say, I, I want to say it because we have friends watching us at this moment, uh, it's very important to remember that viscosity, density, is not necessarily something related to, to the aging because it can be created. 
So just think, just think about the glaze or think about the reduction. Uh, so you can have viscosity, but the viscosity of the traditional balsamic vinegar is a natural viscosity. It comes from the evaporation of the product from those barrels that you have seen in Modena. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Please. No, absolutely. And I, I guess that's why it, we, we said it was very interesting that when you look at the, the calorie count for the different vinegars, that as you go up through it, through the ages, the calorific value grows, which is presumably the concentration of the sugars in, exactly. the, in, in the vinegar. Yeah, uh, exactly. It, 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 that's what makes, makes the density. And that's another danger that could be there waiting for you, because if, when you take out the liquid from the last barrel of, uh, of the, the battery, if you are not very wise and careful and you don't take enough uh, what you need, uh, you, you, you can risk what we call the crystallization, which is a very dangerous thing. Very dangerous thing. You, you can throw out all the product of that barrel and you can imagine the damage. Tell me how you use, if you use it, uh, traditional yeah, balsamic no, in your kitchen. I've used it for a, for, for a long time and I, I think I probably use it in a very similar way. I would use good olive oil. I tend to use it as a seasoning. Um, you know, so maybe drizzled over some asparagus at this time of year. Um, you know, we're right in the middle of the British asparagus season. Um, you know, and I have to say it's the best asparagus in the world. Um, but with some, some beautiful olive oil and a few drops of good balsamic vinegar over it, some shavings of parmesan, um, you know, that's, that's my kind of food. Wonderful, wonderful. Russell, uh, I, I let you go because um, we have other guests. I really want to thank you so much for being with us today. I really hope that also England is going to open soon. We heard yeah. in, in Italy they are starting little by little uh, to open up. Here in the States where I live, uh, all, some states they are starting little by little to reopen. So I really wish uh, every, each one of us to can to join together again soon and have time to instead of doing these sessions live on yeah. instagram yeah. which is nice but, uh, nice but but we like to do something live when we can you know italians we like to hug each other to kiss <laughs> each other we have yeah. this so we, i think most of us we miss this very very much so Absolutely. thank you so much Absolutely. uh congratulations for your a star when you had it for your choices of life uh, because there is always something new to discover in life so thank you um, uh, most of all for being with us today Russell real pleasure real have a great pleasure. day and God save the Queen <laughs> <laughs> Cheerio, no. thank you bye-bye bye-bye